This is a 1992 Geo Metro convertible. And it is, <laughs> well, let's just say the Metro was generally agreed to be the most pathetic little pipsqueak of a car back when it was on sale. And for some reason, they made a convertible version so you could be a pathetic little pipsqueak with your hair blowing in the wind. <laughs> Today, I'm going to review this ridiculous little car. Before I get started, good news! This Geo Metro can be yours. It is currently being auctioned live on Cars and Bids, which is my new enthusiast car auction website for cool cars from the modern era. We've sold McLarens, Ferraris, Porsches, but we also like the weird stuff on Cars and Bids, the quirky cars, and that includes this Metro convertible, which is live right now on Cars and Bids. So after you finish watching this video, click the link in the description below to head over to the live auction where you can bid for the chance to win this Geo Metro. You won't find one of these anywhere but cars and bids. I'll start with a little background. Back in the 1980s, General Motors was looking to introduce a line of ultra-cheap, fuel-efficient cars that didn't really fit in with any of their other brands. So they created Geo, which only sold rebadged Japanese cars made by other manufacturers. There was the Geo Prism, which was a rebadged Toyota Corolla. There was the Geo Tracker, which was a rebadged Suzuki Vitara. And there was this, the Geo Metro, which was a rebadged badged Suzuki Swift. But Swift, it was not. This version of the Metro came out for the 1989 model year. The convertible version joined for 1990. And every single Metro from this era used a three-cylinder engine with about 50 horsepower. Even though this car weighed under 2,000 pounds, acceleration wasn't really a strong suit. But there was a benefit to this. The car was rated at 46 miles per gallon in the city and 49 miles per gallon on the highway, which is an impressive figure even still today. Unfortunately, that's basically the only thing that's impressive about this car, as I will show you. First, I'm going to take you on a tour of this Metro and show you all of its interesting quirks and features. Then I'm going to get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'll give it a Doug score. All right, I'm going to start the quirks and the features of the Metro with getting in. You know how some of my reviews, I show you the key and it's something interesting and cool? Well, in this case, this is the key. Not at all special. Looks like the kind of key you'd buy for $2 at Home Depot. That's what they were using for this car. Basic key for a basic car. And when you open up the door, look how thin this door panel is. There's no side impact protection in there. There's definitely no airbags in there. This was a different era, very basic car, no frills, not a lot to pack into that door panel. But I don't want to get ahead of myself here because one of the major selling points of this car is the convertible top and the roof operation is rather quirky and interesting. It's all manual, so let's talk about it now. To start the process putting the roof up, you first lift off this plastic panel behind the seats. You lift it out of place. Then you slide these plastic panels behind the seats. You can sort of pivot them, you can see, and move it forward and it kind of bumps into the back of the seat. So it might help you to put the seat back forward and give you more space, but that's what you do next. After that, you just lift up the top. It's a fairly easy process. It's a small car. It's a small top, not very heavy. And then you get it right by where the windshield is, of course. The sun visors have to be down, and you just latch it down in place. And then your Geo Metro convertible has the roof up. And of course, when you're done, you slide those panels back into place, the ones behind the seat. And then you put that big center panel back in place, and then you're all set to drive. Now, obviously, if you want to put the top down, you do the same procedure, but in reverse. You pull the big center panel off the back, you slide the side panels forward, then you unlatch the top of the windshield, push it down, and then you put all of the plastic panels back in place, and that's sort of your top cover while you're driving along. And you just have to hope that that center panel, which seems pretty flimsy and not very tightly in there, you have to hope it doesn't just fly off in the wind. But 
there's your GeoMetro convertible top operation in case you pick up one of these and you're wondering how to put the roof up or down. Now, a bigger quirk than the actual operation of the top might be the fact that they made a convertible version of this car at all. It seems bizarre by modern standards because these days, convertibles don't really get made unless they're kind of high-end luxury cars. That's where most convertibles are now. But back when the Metro was being made, having a really cheap convertible like this wasn't really all that unusual. There were convertible versions of everything. You had a Chevy Cavalier convertible. You had the Volkswagen Cabriolet. You had a Toyota Paseo convertible. You had this. Convertibles were just a lot more common than they are today. And so as strange as it is to have an ultra cheap car convertible, can you imagine Chevy making a Spark convertible or a Toyota Yaris convertible? That's what this was. As strange as that seems now, it wasn't that strange back then to have a convertible version of a car like this. And by the way, a quick note about pricing. Back in 92, a base model Geo Metro cost $6,000 new. If you got the four-door version, it was $7,000 new. The convertible was quite a premium at $9,700 new, under 10 grand for a brand new convertible. But it was a Geo Metro. Anyway, next up, more interesting quirks in this interior. I want to talk about the trunk pass-through situation. Now, in your car, if you have a sedan, you might be able to fold down your back seats, and that creates like a pass-through from the trunk to the interior. In this car, behind the seats, you can see there's a little flap. You lift that up, and then behind that, you can see there's another little flap. You go around to the trunk, you lift that flap up, and then that's your pass-through. So there's no like panel separating the interior from the trunk. There's no trim, no carpeting. You just have two like vinyl curtains, and that is your trunk pass-through in this car. This was a very pathetic car in many ways, and one of them was the flimsy afterthought trunk pass-through situation. But anyway, since we're talking about the trunk, let's get back here. The only way into the trunk in this car is to stick the key in the back, twist it, and then lift up the trunk. There's no like trunk latch anywhere else. Now the struts in the trunk are bad, so fortunately we have this handy broomstick that we can use to prop up the trunk. And as you can see, when the trunk is propped, this is a pretty reasonably sized trunk, especially for a vehicle this small. You can get a reasonable amount of cargo in here, good space. It's not so bad. This car is so tiny, but it has a decent size trunk. But if you needed more space than this trunk could offer, the Metro has that capability too because it has a luggage rack mounted on the top of the trunk. This was an option that you could get. You can see these five sort of plastic pieces mounted on the trunk. That was so you could put your luggage on it without scratching the paint. And then you would use these little movable hooks sliding down the plastic things to actually tie your luggage down. So if you had more luggage than could fit in the trunk, you could use this luggage luggage rack. This was a common feature in cars in like the 50s and 60s, not so today, but it was available as an option on the Geo Metro convertible, and this Metro convertible has it. But anyway, back to the interior, although I must say there's not that much to cover in here. This is a small interior, a basic car, not too many quirks, but there are some worth noting. One is the seats. You have these flat, non-contoured seats. They just look like the cheapest, crappiest stuff they could find. Definitely not intended to be supportive if you have back issues or if you want to find a very comfortable position. But they do have blue trim going all the way around to match the blue exterior of this car. They spent the money to make the seats look good instead of make them comfortable. You also have this blue and sort of yellowish green pattern all throughout the seats, this fabric on the seat bottom, the seat back, and on the door panel. This was a big 90s thing, these sort of colored fabric patterns, just to make things more fun inside this car. And it certainly has succeeded. I, for one, I'm having a blast. Now, like I said before, not too many frills in this interior. It's really not that nice of a place to be. Some examples of that, the center console in this car is just this plastic piece mounted on the carpet with the handbrake sticking out. You don't have a big storage area. You don't have anything in here, really, except for the handbrake. Does it look all that good? No frills, very small. That's your center console. Deal with it. And speaking of cheap stuff in the center, on the gear lever, you had the shift boot, which was just rubber. Didn't really look all that nice. Was certainly not as nice as leather 
together in most other vehicles at the time, they were just going for the cheapest stuff they could find. And it looks like it. But it is worth noting with the shifter, at least you had a five speed manual in here, no four speed. You had that fifth gear for better fuel economy and more gears for better performance prowess. It is worth noting though, that the automatic version of this car was a three speed automatic and it wasn't a very good one. The auto was rated at 10 miles per gallon less city and highway than the manual. The manual's 46 city, 49 highway. The automatic was 36 city, 39 highway. You lost 10 miles per gallon just by choosing the automatic. So you really wanted to go with the manual in this car to maximize your gas mileage. One other kind of funny cost cutting measure, obviously this car doesn't have power mirrors. If you want to adjust the mirror on the driver's side, there's this little stick coming out from the mirror and you just move it around and that moves the mirror, which is pretty common on cars with manual mirrors. The funny part is over on the passenger side, there is no stick. They've cost cut out the manual mirror stick. Instead, to move the passenger mirror, you actually have to get out, go over there and adjust it with your fingers, which causes a bit of an issue because then you can't see where you've adjusted it to. So then you walk back into the driver's seat. Oh no, it's too high. Get back out, walk back to the passenger seat. Although I guess in this car, it's so tiny, you could probably reach across the interior and adjust the mirror that way, but the stick would have been helpful. However, deemed too expensive, probably. With that said, there are some features in this car that I'm surprised to see in here. Some nice stuff that I wouldn't expect in such a cheap car with such a cheap car reputation. For instance, you have an airbag in this car. Only one, driver's side, not passenger, not side airbags, but you do have an airbag in here, which would have been a big deal on a new car for under 10 grand back in 92. Now, interestingly, when you turn on this car, the airbag light briefly turns on, like in most cars, to let you know the light is working, except in this car it says, in full, rest. Couldn't figure out what that meant. I looked it up, inflatable restraint. The term airbag was still sort of becoming more common. No one was sure what it would be called. General Motors was calling it the inflatable restraint. And if you had a fault there, that light would turn on to let you know, like a modern airbag light would. By the way, another feature I'm surprised to see in here, the gauge cluster has a full tachometer. You would expect that in a car with a manual transmission, especially a modern one, but really cheap cars sometimes forego a tachometer, but they had it here. So they weren't doing all cost cutting. However, the feature I am most surprised to see in here, the luxury that this car has that most shocks me is air conditioning. This little tiny car has an air conditioning system. You press this button, you turn on AC, and then you can control the temperature. I'm really, really shocked to see that in a car like this. Now, the owner tells me when you turn on the air conditioning, it saps like 10 to 20% of this car's power, which is a big deal because it doesn't have that much power to begin with. But nonetheless, AC was there to keep you cool on a day where it was too hot to even put your roof down. Interesting. Now, with that said, it is important to point out General Motors pretty much did cost cut wherever possible with this car. One good example is the owner's manual. You open up the pouch, this car comes with an owner's manual, but they didn't make a separate owner's manual for the convertible like everybody else would have. Instead, if you got a convertible, they gave you a supplement to the original owner's manual, which is supposed to override some of the information you got in the standard owner's manual they also gave you. Of course, it also gave you some new information like how to put the top up and down, that sort of thing. But you had basically two owner's manuals because they were too cheap to print up a totally new one just for the convertible. And by the way, speaking of that convertible owner's manual, I love the convertible drawing on the front of the owner's manual. This sort of pastel looking thing looks great, looks very 90s, and it's kind of a cool artist's take on the look of the Geo Metro convertible. By the way, two other interesting things in here. One, I love this emergency key that came in the owner's manual pouch. This car came with an emergency plastic key. And I'm not sure if you could use that like once to turn the car on, or if you could use that to get more real keys made if you lost your key, but still an emergency plastic key. What a bizarre novelty this car has. It's still in the owner's manual after all these years. Also still in the owner's manual is the original business card from the salesperson from when this car was sold new at George White Chevrolet in Ames, Iowa. Believe it or not, that dealership still exists, but I bet no one there remembers back when they were selling bright blue Metro convertibles new. It was a long time ago. And speaking of George White Chevrolet, you can still see their logo back here on the back of this car. It's held up well over the years. And in fact, this whole car is held up pretty well. It certainly isn't perfect, but as Metro convertibles go, 
though this is certainly one of the nicest ones you will ever find. Nobody thought to preserve these or save these, and it's nice to see one in such relatively nice condition. But anyway, moving on, I want to talk a light bar. You can see this car has a giant light bar going across the back. That was the standard of its day. The late 80s, early 90s, light bars were hot just as they are now. They've completely come back. And even economy cars of the day had light bars in the back to let you know just how cool they were. That was the trend at the time. And next up, since I'm on the outside of this car, a few more interesting items to discuss. One, the tires. These are incredibly small, 13 inch tires with these hubcaps on them. And they're just so narrow. Take a look at how tiny these tires are. Incredibly small, but that was all they needed. It wasn't like this vehicle was massive or very heavy, so you could get away with putting on these small tires. I also want to touch on this, this ridiculous little pastel paintbrush graphic down the side. This is factory, and you can see it on both sides, passenger side here and over on the driver's side as well. And it was just sort of a 90s thing. This was a fun, cool car, so let's put this little splash of color on the side. And a lot of 90s cars had similar graphics like this, and it's just kind of funny to see it well preserved. Nobody ever bothered to take it off, and now it looks cool and retro. Next up, another interesting exterior item with this car is the Geo logo. You can see it fully in the front. It's sort of this oval shape, and it's meant to signify the world, the globe, and you can see sort of lines of latitude and longitude. And in the center, you have the Chevrolet logo. That's because Geos were sold at Chevrolet dealers, like George White Chevrolet in Ames, Iowa. <laughs> and it was sort of an entry-level brand for General Motors. The theory was you buy a Geo, the cheapest car in the showroom, and then maybe a few years later, you had a good experience, you come back and buy a Chevrolet and sort of work your way up through the Chevrolet and General Motors lineups. Now, as for the design of the logo itself, the world logo, I think, is supposed to signify that this was sort of a world car. Geo was born in the era where General Motors had a very poor reputation for reliability. Obviously, that has changed, but back then, it was the Japanese who had the strongest reliability reputation, just like today. And since this car was manufactured by Suzuki and other Geo vehicles were rebadged Japanese cars, they wanted to signify somehow that it wasn't your typical General Motors American crappy car, hence the world logo signifying this car came from the globe, not just America. And that point was driven home in the driver's door jam. You open it up to see the VIN plate and it says manufactured by Suzuki. Like I said, this was a rebadged Suzuki Swift. The Swift was sold in North America, but we never got the convertible version. That was unique to the Metro, but the car was still built by Suzuki and they didn't even try to cover that up. That's what it says on the VIN plate. It was a global car, a Japanese General Motors for better reliability. Unfortunately, being a global car, the Metro also got a global engine. This was a one liter three cylinder that made about 50 horsepower. And it just wasn't up to the standard Americans were used to in terms of acceleration and performance. The trade-off was excellent fuel economy. And there still are people who are loyal to the Geo Metro for its simplicity, for its cheapness to own, and for its great mileage without having to resort to new technology like hybrid, which makes cars more expensive and more complicated. But for for most people, too small of an engine, too little power. That was kind of the trade-off. You got the Japanese car with the Japanese build quality, but you also got 50 horsepower. That was a tremendously small number even then. And back then, the Geo Metro was the butt of a lot of jokes, kind of being referred to as the cheapest, crappiest, most pathetic car on sale, which frankly it was. Unless, of course, you got the convertible. <laughs> And so those are the quirks and features of the Geo Metro Convertible. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. All right, driving the Metro Convertible. You know how sometimes you get into an economy car and they have some sport version or some convertible version and you drive that and it just feels like a transformed experience, like a totally different and better car? Yeah, this isn't that. <laughs> This car is really just a Geo Metro, but with a removable top, like a convertible soft top. So it drives like a Geo Metro. This car is not some paragon of handling. It's not like the Fiat 500 drives okay, but then you get into the Abarth and it's like amazing. This ain't that. For one thing, it's just slow. It is dog slow. This car, it's almost unbelievable how underperforming it is. Um, Geo Metro owners will defend this car to the, and there are people, they will defend this car to the day of their death saying slow, simple car, 
that's why fuel economy is good. Where we went wrong was adding all this tech and complication of cars. And I get that, but this thing's really slow. It's just, it's just difficult for a rational modern human being to drive this and not feel a little unsafe, especially considering the car itself is so tiny. It weighs nothing, it has no safety equipment, it's just a joke of a car, and it's incredibly slow, so it's not like you can get out of the way of anything. Now, the other thing you notice, especially with this one, is the sheer amount of cowl shake in this car. Chassis rigidity is not a strong suit of the Geo Metro convertible. Quite the opposite, in fact. It is a absolute downfall. Every bump you go over, the windshield just shakes like it wants to come off, and this is a nice one. This car isn't perfect. Like I said, 28,000 miles, though, on this car. It's not like it's been destroyed and miled up. The interior is nice. This is how it was from the factory. Now, I'm flooring it here, by the way, and you can see I'm getting passed by a Chevy Bolt. I'm literally foot on the floor, and that Bolt just kind of overtook me out, accelerated me, probably the only doing half throttle. <laughs> Okay, this car just isn't much. It's just not all that fast. It's just not all that fun. To me, the quirkiness of this car comes in sort of, it was always scapegoated as being the crappiest car of its day. Once the Yugo went away, the Geo Metro was sort of the laughing stock of the car community. And driving this one, you can certainly see why. Even the convertible, the nice one, it's just so pathetic. Now, you know, they had air conditioning. They had, it, was, it wasn't that bad but it wasn't good. The harshness and the vibration of this car is also pretty substantial. I mean, you get it coming through the steering wheel, the gear lever, the passenger seat, you can see it. It's not as bad as I was expecting, actually. Uh, I know cars from this era, and they're usually a total disaster. This one, again, pretty well kept for a Metro convertible, but at the end of the day, it's still a Metro convertible. This car is kind of charming in the sense that it's like a simple little car, hydraulic steering, simple manual transmission. You just sort of push the clutch in and go. You hear everything, you hear the engine. Um, it, there is some nostalgia there for me, like, oh, this was an era where, you know, that sort of stuff, the cars were simpler and, and they felt simpler to drive. But they, they weren't better. I mean, this one certainly wasn't. It does not drive like much of a car. It just doesn't have any power and it doesn't have any handling. <laughs> and the charm of this car really comes in its like basicness and the fact that you're just like keeping a Geo Metro on the road, which at this point is actually kind of cool. It's like, wow, okay, I haven't seen one of those in a while. And I will admit this car does draw some attention. It's a bright color, convertible top. People are looking like, is that dude, draw Whoa, is that a Geo Met? Somebody, I was just filming, somebody came up and said, what a cute car. And it is kind of cute. And so that's the Geo Metro Convertible. I've always wanted to review a Metro because it's become sort of a cheap car icon. And after spending the day with one, I can tell you, it's certainly cheap. <laughs> but it has some charm to it also, and you can't argue with almost 50 miles per gallon. And now it's time to give this Metro Convertible a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the Metro Convertible is fine, not ugly, not beautiful, an easy 5 out of 10. Acceleration, uh, well, 1 out of 10. Handling is also bad, not dangerous, but it's not exactly a dynamic masterpiece or anything close, and it gets a 2 out of 10. Fun factor is somewhat strong, though, manual transmission, convertible top, and the irony of driving a Geo Metro, and it gets a 3 out of 10. Cool factor is also elevated a bit by its Metro-ness. It's still not a great car, but if I saw one of these at Cars and Coffee, I would definitely give it a glance and it gets a 4 out of 10 for a total weekend score of 15 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories and features. It has only the basics and it gets a 2 out of 10. Comfort is fine, not especially great. It's a small, buzzy car with not much interior room and it gets a 3 out of 10. Quality is actually okay. The interior materials aren't good, but reliability is decent and it's just cheap to own. With readily available parts and very easy fixing, if something does break, it gets a 5 out of 10. Practicality is low with only two seats and not much other space and it gets a 2 out of 10. Finally, value. And I gotta say, this car is sort of an icon for people who love cheap cars. It's not thrilling or exciting, but it is kind of a fun throwback, and it's just not expensive. Probably a few grand for one of the nicest metros I'm sure exists on the planet. It gets a 6 out of 10 for a total daily score of 18 out of 50. Added up in the Doug score is 33 out of 100, which places it here against other sort of similar cars I've reviewed. The Geo Metro convertible isn't uh, great, but it's hilarious, and I'm thrilled I had the chance to review one. Ah!